So we will now present uh, two challenging cases in rectal cancer, and I will start with the first one. We don't have a voting system, so I suggest that you raise hands with the different questions. So the first patient I am going to present is a, a woman of 65 years old. She has no relevant medical history, no family history of cancer. She presents with anal bleeding and has no other symptoms. On digital rectal examination, she has a tumoral mass two centimeters above the sphincter. Her CA is normal. The biopsy shows a moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. There are no distant metastases on CT scan of the thorax and the abdomen. On MR, there is a tumor at 5.5 centimeters of the anal verge. It's semicircular. It shows a deep central ulceration, and there are more than nine small local regional lymph nodes. The distance to the mesorectal fascia is more than five millimeters. So my question to you is, what is next? And here are some options. Either we go straight to surgery, or we use the short course immediately followed by surgery. We can use a long course of chemo radiation followed by APR after six to eight weeks. A long course of chemo radiation followed by TME after six to eight weeks, or maybe some of you have other IDs. So who would go for surgery only? Okay, one, two. Maybe you as a surgeon can comment on that? In going for surgery alone, um, you know, we, we, we treat these patients in the multidisciplinary setting. And although I might be inclined, I don't think that my colleagues will let me do that. Um, I, I, I hear that they have five lymph nodes, is that correct? There are, there are more than eight small lymph nodes, but hard to say whether they are malignant or not. Uh, you have uh, more, than, more than five millimeters to the mesorectal fascia, so I suspect your tumor is T3A, maybe early T3B. So uh, this patient is actually unlikely to have, you can see nine lymph nodes. Gina will say, yes, you can see nine lymph nodes, but they're unlikely to be involved. <laughs> But it is a low-seated tumor. Well, it's above the dentate line. It's a, you, 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 you wouldn't have a problem in the surgeons I work with in doing a, uh, a resection there without, without a stoma. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, surgically this patient will need a coloanal. Um, the tumor is only two centimeters above the sphincter. I doubt that you will be able to do a double stapling, but it's, uh, a sphincter saving procedure is technically feasible. Um, I think, I don't know if you want to say something, Andres, but in the United States, we have now opened the prospect trial, um, intermediate risk tumors that uh, will be randomized to induction chemotherapy. I think in our institution, we also favor induction chemotherapy. A lot of leaf nodes give anything risk of distant metastasis. So one can argue about the starting with induction chemotherapy and then see the response. And so you don't use radiation then, or depending on the response? Uh, that will be an option, just like the prospect trial, it will be the radiation will depend on the response. If this tumor responds very well to systemic chemotherapy, just on systemic chemotherapy and then surgery. We typically do four months of uh, four folks. Okay. Are there any other questions or remarks? We did something a bit different. So first of all, we discussed the patient at the multidisciplinary clinic. And we decided to go for the long course of chemo radiation with a continuous infusion of 5-FU. And then the idea was that six to eight weeks after the end of the chemo radiation, we would go for TME and sphincter saving surgery. But then we did an MR before the start of the chemo radiation. You've seen the images. You also see the uh, B1000 image on the bottom. And then at the time of surgery, you can still see some tumor on the T2-weighted image, but on the B1000 image, there is no signal left. On clinical examination, there is also no remaining tumor. So now the question is, what do we do? Do we go for a wait-and-see approach? Do we go for a TEM procedure, a TME procedure, 
a boost with brachytherapy or something else? Who would go for wait and see? Yes, but the microphone is not on. Can you switch the microphone on? Well, I would talk to the patient. But do we believe that the lymph nodes were involved or not? Because well, if we believe that it's involved, the decision will be different. No. Well, these are endless discussions with our radiologists. The only thing I can say is that there are no remaining lymph nodes on the imaging at the time of surgery. Uh, we usually have some kind of like secretary during MDT, and secretary writes the decision. If the secretary writes N plus, the decision will be now different. <laughs> if secretary at the start written N minus but suspected. Our, we don't have a secretary, so we write ourselves. <laughs> but <laughs> for us, it so was. So wait and see, because it was N minus. Uh, okay, yeah. we wrote N plus. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't you need to sit down? Don't you need to sit down with the patient and say, "Look, we can do a wait and see here. It's not standard of care, but we can do a wait and see treatment here. What it will involve is you having a lot of tests over the next few years. How long?" was probably of debate, you probably have a 6 or 7% risk of recurrence that will be unresectable in the future, but you will avoid major surgery, and uh, the vast majority of people uh, in this situation, 70% or so, will maintain uh, a, a reasonable f function and not require an operation. And which do you think you can cope with? Don't you need to sit down with the patient and, and go through that, rather than saying, wait and see, or TAM, or whatever. Of course. And as a surgeon, would you do a TAM procedure in this patient or not? Well, I guess, you know, still in, in, in the United States and most of the world, um, the standard treatment, it will be a total mesorectal excision. Of the options that you present there, um, I don't think I would give more brachytherapy to this patient, more radiation. I don't believe in TAMs in somebody who might have had positive lymph nodes at baseline before the chemo radiation. My choice will be between having a total mesorectal excision or just watch and wait. And, and the decision is shared with the patients. We, we have some experience, we have some data from having done watch and wait for a number of years retrospectively. We have now an ongoing prospective trial. This patient probably is a good candidate. If the patient has a clinical and radiological complete response six to eight weeks after finishing chemo radiation, probably is a patient that is a good candidate as long as as he was emphasized before, she's willing to come for repeated exams. Because, you know, as we know, 20% of the patients will regrow. More, the yeah. tumor will regrow, so we have to inform the patient very well. But I think she will be a good candidate for that. But you registered the patient in a prospective study. Well, we have a prospective trial, but we do have many patients that they are treated out of trial because, you know, we have some requirements about the, the induction versus consolidation. We randomize patients. So we, we treat a number of patients outside of the trial with full disclosure of what to expect. Um, and some patients are willing to undergo watch and wait, and some patients don't. Um, they are not willing to take the risk of uh, tumor regrowth and the uncertainty um, about maybe just having the tumor progress to a point where we cannot do the same operation that we can do at that point. Okay. So our patient underwent TME surgery. And at the time of the pathological evaluation, there was no residual viable tumor tissue and zero out of the 15 lymph nodes were negative. So the com clinical complete remission was confirmed. And then my last question is, what would you do next? Is there anyone who would give adjuvant chemotherapy after a pathological complete remission? No one? Huh? Okay. What do the clinical oncologists say? In the panel? <laughs> Well, normally, uh, when I think about this patient, I, my, my 
preferred option would have been to go straight for surgery. And then perhaps if those lymph nodes are, are negative and it's a, an early stage, I wouldn't have uh, offered any type of uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. But even now, having a PCR, I think uh, those patients are going to enjoy a very prolonged uh, uh, um, Probability, uh, high probability of prolonged survival. So, in general, in cases that are favorable in MRI, in initial MRI, like this one, uh, I do not recommend, and, and re having a complete response, I do not recommend adjuvant chemotherapy. Okay, thank you. And then, Andres, it's your case now. Thank you. I need a bit more. Yeah. Can we have the second case? The break. So thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to challenge you with this case that uh, challenged us some uh, weeks ago. It's a 62-year-old male, uh, uh, good health, uh, presenting with uh, quite uh, uh, symptomatic, with uh, constipation, rectal bleeding, false diarrhea and tenesmus implying obstructive defecation, but a good general condition in general. So um, physical examination was unremarkable, excepting uh, in the digital rest rectal exam where a fixed tumors, uh, a tumor was located at three centimeters from the anal verge involving three quarters of the um, circumference. So in the, in the rigid rectoscopy, a fixed tumor was, was, um, was uh, uh, confirmed. The biopsy showed a poorly differentiated invasive adenocarcinoma and the rectum. And colonoscopy, because the tumor was not completely obstructed, could be completed without showing any polyps or any uh, synchronous um, uh, tumors in the colon. So there was a very light uh, CEA um, elevation, 12.9, and um, in the CT scan, uh, nine uh, liver metastatic nodes uh, were uh, found involving both uh, sides of the liver. So this is the, the CT uh, scan, not very big um, meds, mostly involving the their, their right liver lobe, but also some of them in the, in the uh, left. So we start with uh, staging the rectum, and this was quite an advanced uh, uh, tumor, uh, having uh, involvement of the um, uh, puborectal um, uh, muscle, the, the, the right one, and um, uh, also there was a lymph node just at the mesorectal uh, fascia. Uh, this is the the, the axial uh, view of uh, of the of the tumor, uh, showing involvement of all three uh, layer of the bowel and reaching almost the the, pe the pelvic uh, wall. So this, the report was, was uh, in, that, in that sense. So it's a bulky rectal tumor below the levators, located at one centimeter from the anal verge, and uh, several nodes with suspected uh, neoplastic uh, involvement, and uh, also puborectal uh, muscle uh, involvement. No um, MV was uh, detected, and no extra mesorectal uh, nodes uh, were uh, detected. So in summary, this is a symptomatic, locally advanced rectal cancer um, uh, with uh, synchronous uh, metastatic disease, um, liver only, and uh, uh, all RAS and BRAF uh, was well typed. Uh, this patient was fit without uh, comorbidities, and uh, we were willing not to uh, miss any opportunities with this uh, uh, patient. So what, what would be your treatment plan? Because this is a, a situation that it happens frequently in the clinic where we may have a synchronous, uh, locally advanced rectal tumors with um, 
uh, limited uh, uh, metastatic disease, I mean limited, not in number, but limited to a single organ, in this case, is the liver. So uh, what would, would you be your approach? Who of you would be in favor of chemo radiation followed by chemotherapy? No? Uh, chemotherapy plus anti-EGFR, and let's uh, see what happened. Okay, some of you, thank you. Um, who would go for five times five followed by chemotherapy? Okay, Rolf and uh, Karin are going, and also some of you. Uh, direct uh, TMA um, upfront plus chemotherapy, almost no one. And uh, liver resection first plus chemo radiation thereafter. Okay, so our decision was to go five times five uh, followed by chemotherapy. The point of this was that our patient was very severely symptomatic, having uh, pain, having uh, bleeding. So we decided to go for radiation. And this, in general, if you go for five times five, uh, you may get a very uh, quick um, control of those uh, symptoms. So we went to a, a multidisciplinary team discussion, and then um, we, we went for, for this. Uh, radiation was given, uh, five times five uh, gray, um, for symptomatic purposes. And then chemotherapy was started two weeks later. Uh, the patient was considered eligible for a randomized uh, phase two trial with Folfox plus uh, BEV, uh, plus minus uh, an experimental ag agent. And then what we did is that uh, we went back uh, to uh, reassess uh, uh, tumor size and, and um, eight weeks after starting chemotherapy. So uh, the patient got much better clinically much better, no symptoms at all. And in the MRI, there are very clear signs that this tumor shrinkage, um, and also um, our uh, radiologist, uh, who is a very experienced uh, MRI uh, pelvic uh, person, uh, told us that, the, that there was some kind of uh, uh, important uh, features indicating tumor regression in the, in the primary tumor the digital rectal examination was normal, and even there was no mucosal damage in, um, in, the, in the rigid rectoscopy uh, we, we perform. So we went then to the liver, and of course there was also a nice response, but some nodes were still uh, uh, present. So this is a, really a challenging case, having good response in both sides. So we thought uh, uh, we have to uh, reconsider the situation and to have a plan for this patient. So what would, you, would be your, your approach? So who of you would go for liver surgery followed by TME? Okay. Uh, or TME followed by liver surgery. You know that there are the two approaches. Okay. Then liver surgery and surveillance, uh, wait and see approach for the primary rectal tumor. Okay, some of you. And no further therapy and reintroduce treatment upon progression. That's the, the other possibility. I don't know if, uh, if uh, 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 some members of the panels uh, like to have any comments on this point. Yeah, I think um, you know the idea of giving chemotherapy up front is is uh, something that we share in the United States. The five times five is not very popular, but I see the appealing in this case, giving the the radiation, the short core radiation, to not delay the systemic chemotherapy. I don't know if I would have used VEV at the at the beginning because that condition, the time of the surgery a little bit, and had this patient not responded well and required surgery, will have compromised that. But I would have agreed with the start in the chemotherapy. Now, if the response is very good, at the end of the day, the fate of this patient is going to determine by the liver meds. So that's going to probably uh, drive the whole surgical approach. Um, some patients are going to need to have removal of the primary tumor if there is no response for, for uh, you know, just symptomatic control. 
but I think uh, this is a case that I will discuss very closely with my liberal colleagues and um, probably time it well in relation to the maximal response before the patient, uh, you know, achieve, I uh, will develop some liver toxicity from the chemotherapy. But if they feel that they can be, the, the, the liver can be um, um, cured or at least attentive to complete resection, I think I will go probably with liver surgery. In our institution, depending on the performance of the patient, sometimes we do synchronous resection, not infrequently. APRs is not something that we do that often with liver surgery, particularly if the liver surgery is extensive. So I would be inclined to you know, just do liver surgery if there are residual lesions after achieving maximal clinical response. So, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, well, I, I think that five times five followed by chemotherapy is a very flexible way of doing things. Um, we would then, as, as usually then, if, if, it, if the liver is resectable, we would go and resect the liver and probably talk to the patient and say, you know, there's still quite a big risk that you'll develop other metastatic disease, so why don't we defer, if, if, if we think that uh, you've got a complete clinical response, we could defer that decision for six or 12 months um, and then make, you know, sit down and talk that through in about six or 12 months. But many patients will relapse again and it will be irrelevant, really. No. So then, then uh, uh, we went for, for liver surgery. Um, then uh, liver surgery was planned eight, after eight courses of Folfox Beth and pl plus four courses of uh, uh, fluorouracil, leucovorin, and bevacizumab because we stopped oxaliplatin after eight courses according to this to this trial. And I have, to, I, 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 will have, I have to agree with Julio in the fact that when we go to liver surgery, it's better to go earlier before any uh, liver toxicity is, uh, is, uh, is done. So uh, a right hepatectomy after right hepatic artery embolization was performed uh, six weeks after the last dose of bevacizumab. And then uh, we, we uh, decided to uh, do only follow-up for the uh, uh, primary uh, rectal tumor after discussing uh, for, with the patient. But the only, uh, I mean, the recommended surgical approach would be, uh, would be APR, and um, uh, this was not, uh, I mean, very well accepted by by the patient. So the patient was uh, operated in the liver. He stayed in the hospital only for seven days. There was no liver damage, so no steatosis or steatonecrosis or sinusoidal occlusive disease. But the pathologist couldn't find in those necrotic areas any uh, tumor deposit. So this patient was defined as a pathological complete remission in the, in the liver. And um, uh, of course, there were some multiple scar areas with necrotic material, but no rest of malignant cells. So our plan is to follow this patient with a rectal exam plus proctoscopy plus MRI every four months, because I think this patient has a high possibility of uh, relapsing in the, in the rectum, and also a CT scan every three months to follow up on the metastatic disease. But so far, is uh, disease and progression-free 20 months after diagnosis. So our conclusion is that this is a locally advanced rectal cancer with synchronous multiple uh, liver meds as the only organ with, uh, with uh, involvement. In the multidisciplinary discussion is essential for all rectal cancer cases, even those with synchronous meds. And it's very important at the start uh, during treatment and during follow-up because all those issues may happen uh, to individual patients. Uh, we. Uh, underscore our approach that do not miss any opportunity for, 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 this, for this patient. Uh, five uh, times five radiation plus chemotherapy uh, may induce good clinical uh, remission, even uh, um, uh, complete remissions. And after chemotherapy, liver resection was recommended if METs uh, become uh, resectable. Uh, so I do see uh, surveillance are, as stated in the, in the previous clinical case of the primary tumor 
as an emerging option that has to be discussed uh, carefully with uh, with uh, uh, the patient. And our case uh, shows a successful multimodality treatment of a patient with uh, with um, uh, 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 difficult disease. When when my surgeons challenge me, this approach is curative or palliative. Uh, I answer, I don't know, but we have to try to do the best in any moment. And this was our approach. Thank you.